We turn this morning in God's Word to the book of 2 Kings once again. Last week we looked at 2 Kings chapter 18 and the threats that were placed against King Hezekiah and against Judah by the kings of Assyria. And this morning we pick up the story and we see how the story turns out. And uh, we're doing this all through the lens of the themes of Our World Belongs to God, the contemporary testimony that Lois read part of for us earlier. And we're in that section kind of just setting the stage by reminding us that our world does not belong to us or earthly powers, but our world belongs to God who created, sustains, and redeems it in Jesus Christ. So we read today from 2 Kings chapter 19, beginning at verse 20. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I've heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and mocks you. The daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Who is it that you have insulted and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your eyes, your voice, and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers, you have heaped insults on the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots, I have ascended on the heights of the mountains, the utmost heights of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars, the choicest of its pines. I have reached its remotest parts, the finest of its forests. I have dug wells in foreign lands and drunk the water there. With the soles of my feet, I have dried up all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard? Long ago I ordained it. In days of old I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass that you turn fortified cities into piles of stone. Their people drained of power are dismayed and put to shame. They are like plants in the field, like tender green shoots, like grass sprouting on the roof, scorched before it grows up. But I know where you stay and when you're, where, where you come against me and how you rage against me. Because you rage against me and your insolence has reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will make you return by the way you came. This will be the sign for you, O Hezekiah. This year you will eat what grows by itself, and the second year what springs from that. But in the third year you sow, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Once more a remnant of the house of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. For out of Jerusalem will come a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter the city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with a shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return, declares the Lord. He will not enter the city. I will defend this city and save it for, the sake, for my sake and the sake of David, my servant. That night, an angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. And so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adramelech and Sherezer cut him down with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Ezarhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends of Jesus, tomorrow, as you know, is a holiday, the most important political holiday on the American calendar. The 4th of July is a fun day. It's a day filled with picnics and parties and fireworks and parades. It's a day when we celebrate the ideals of our country. I was reminded of this a couple of years ago when Brandy and I took the kids on the 4th of July and we went up to Concord, where, of course, the Lexington and Concord, there was the bridge, the, you know, the, the beginning of the American Revolution there. And on the 4th of July, they have a reenactment, if you haven't been there. Uh, they have a reenactment. They, they, the colonial regiments are dressed up in their, their uniform and they come marching down and they parade in front of the bridge. And there's a reading of the Declaration of Independence. And it's a reminder to everybody who's there that our nation has ideals and, and look how many of them we've accomplished. 
Now, of course, in recent years, there's, the 4th of July have also been an occasion to remind our country of its shortcomings, the ways that we've fallen short of those ideals. And, of course, there's much that could be said about that as well. But a lot of, for a lot of celebrations, whether it's triumphing or celebrating the triumph of our ideals or celebrating how far short we've come, the 4th of July still has this sense to it that these ideals are largely within our reach. The values of liberty and equality, of diversity and tolerance and personal achievement that celebrates either what we have done as a country or what we think we will soon be able to do if all the things just line up the right way. Now, of course, there's something healthy as Christians about celebrating our country and its contributions to the human race. But there's also, for Christians, in this country in particular, a temptation. We hear about it from time to time. A temptation, on the one hand, to equate the accomplishments of American and a democracy and culture with the work of God's saving power. Or if not the accomplishments, then maybe to, create, to equate the ambitions of American culture and democracy with God's saving strength. And that's where we meet Hezekiah this morning. It's a temptation that wasn't only for us, but it's a temptation that existed for Israel and for every other nation of the world over the course of history. This morning we see the ways that God delivers the king and his people from what seems to be a helpless situation. And it sets in front of us this question of where does our strength, where does our deliverance come from? Last week, it's where do we are trusting. This week, the question is, what, did, what happened in order to bring about our deliverance? In response to the accusation of the Assyrian officers that Israel's hope lay in the powers of this world, either the power of Assyria or it's in its own strength, our text today makes clear that the earth is the Lord's and all power, all strength come from him. Sometimes we feel like we have the ability to manipulate or control the matters of this world, things that lie within our grasp. But we remember today that ultimately this world, and especially our salvation, do not lie in our power, but in the hand of a God who gives it shape and continues to sustain it by his grace and by his strength. When we left Hezekiah last week, we found a seemingly overwhelming threat force threatening the city of Jerusalem and the Assyrian officers challenging the people with this question, on what are you placing this trust of yours? And at that point, we noticed that Hezekiah's officers had not responded in any way because the only answer that they could possibly give, we trust in God, was an answer that they knew the Assyrians were not going to hear anyhow. And so, at the end of last week's text, the people were waiting, and the enemy was waiting. And the reader of Scripture is waiting to see what will God do. Will he come through for his people, or will Jerusalem be yet another city that the enemy has sacked, has conquered? In between last week's text and this week, there was a brief reprieve. The Assyrian army had to withdraw from, from attacking Judah and, and return to the coastline where the Egyptians were, were marching out to meet them. But Sennacherib didn't see this as something that led him to withdraw his threats. Instead, he sent messengers with a letter to Hezekiah saying, in essence, Hezekiah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you. That's in verse 10. And it's a wor a, a something worth noting because it's a threat, I think, that make, comes up over and over again in our context today. In our secular world, the impression that we're given is there is no God. There's no higher power. There's no authority to which we answer. And so this world and everything that we want to accomplish has to be within our own strength, or so we're told. And this morning, we hear in response, no, this world is the Lord's. And as the prophet responds to King Hezekiah's prayer, we find a couple of things. First of all, the point, first point that the prophet makes involves the folly of human achievement. And this is addressed especially to Sennacherib, but it's meant for all of us to listen in on. It's not just that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, needs to hear this. It's not just that big, powerful bad guys out there somewhere need to hear this. We all need to hear it in some way. But Sennacherib is told that he is not in control of things as much as he'd like to think. 
Sennacherib had boasted of the nations he had conquered and the lands he had brought under his control. He suggested that he is a virtually unstoppable force. And if we read these verses at the beginning of, of our text for this morning, we see him saying that there was nowhere he can't get to. No forest, no desert, no river can stop him. Now, the account last week didn't have Sennacherib saying all of these things per se, but if we read the annals of the kings of Assyria and other similar rulers of the ancient Near East, they're saying these kinds of things all the time. It's a little like the hype. If you ever watched WrestleMania, or you've seen the hype leading up to WrestleMania, now, I haven't watched WrestleMania, just to, but, you know, once you've been in this world for about 30 or 40 years, eventually you run across something of this kind of thing, Right? You know, there's a bunch of trash talk that leads, you know, in the weeks leading up to this. And, you know, the, the various contestants are saying, you know, talking about their accomplishments and how much they can do and how strong they are and how they're just going to break this other guy and drop him like a rock. And, and then on the other hand, you know, there are all sorts of creative insults for the other guy. And, and this is what goes on. And, and this is a kind of thing. This is the sense that we have of the way that the Assyrian kings and indeed the way that the world works. But as God's rebuke makes clear, there's a point at which boasting no longer sounds threatening, and it just sounds silly, which, of course, is the point of WrestleMania, right? It's entertainment, right? These guys aren't actually trying to tell you that they're going to, you know, snap somebody in two like a twig. It's, it's humor. What God is doing here is pushing Sennacherib and really all of us on this question. Can you really do all the things that you say you can do? I mean, for Sennacherib, he's boasting that he's chopping down 100-foot trees and he's, he's digging wells in the desert all by himself. I mean, even if those wells are getting dug, Sennacherib's not doing that all by himself. It's not about the king. It's not even about his army. God's words cut us down to size as human beings. When we're tempted to place our hope and our confidence that the world is going to change, the world is going to be a better place, and it's because we are going to do it, God reminds us it's not about us. It's about him. Like the closing chapters of Job, where God says to Job, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Job, where were you when I, I put the storehouses of the rain and the snow in place? Where were you, Job? Have you done this? God exposes our sinful pride and reminds us that we aren't nearly as powerful as we like to think, that the world does not belong to us or to any earthly powers. That leads to the second point Isaiah makes, both for Hezekiah and for Assyria and for us to listen in on today, and that involves the power of God's plan. We may not be able to dry up rivers and find water in the wasteland and force cities into submission and so on, but there is a God who can do all these things. And so we find God asking the king Sennacherib in verse 25, Have you not heard? Long ago I ordained it. Now I have brought it to pass that you turn fortified cities into piles of stone. In other words, Assyria needs to remember that its power comes from somewhere else. Not from its own strength, but from a God who's in charge of all things. For that matter, this is what weak nations like Judah need to know as well, that Assyria's power comes from somewhere else. And because it comes from somewhere else, it is limited and under the control of the hand of God. Just as God ordained Sennacherib's rise, he would control its, his fall. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, God says in verse 28, and I will make you return by the way that you came. And this is good news, I think, for God's people when they struggle and when they suffer. Because sometimes it feels like the forces of evil, the forces of trouble in our world are so overwhelming that they're just going to wash over us and there's nothing we can do about it. And God reminds us here that there is a limit to his tolerance for wickedness and hardship in the world and for the, the, the punishment that he allows his people to suffer. You know, we get these questions sometimes, don't we? We have these questions in our own minds. God, why did you let this or that happen? Why did this bad thing get to go on for so long? And I'll admit, we don't always have good answers for that, at least not satisfying answers. But I always think whenever that question comes up in my mind, 
that it's much better to know that the hard things of this world are in the control of a good God than to imagine that somehow those difficult things, those, whether they be health concerns, the problems of our world, whether they're out of, that they're out of control. As our contemporary testimony reminds us, Lois read this a little while ago, God formed sea, sky, land, and everything else. He gave it shape and order. The earth is the Lord's. We have this assurance here that God has things in order, that he's working them out towards a plan. That God is good. He has his people's welfare in mind, and nothing can stand against that plan. And so we're reminded that the world doesn't belong to us or to earthly powers. But that's actually a good thing. Because we can leave the world then in a sovereign hand of a God who is good. And a God whose goodness we see all the more when we move towards the story of redemption. A God who has redeemed that world and made it new again in Jesus Christ. And that leads next to the assurance of God's provision. The assurance of God's provision. I think it's interesting here that you notice that God doesn't start by assuring Hezekiah that, you know, things will be okay, you're going to prosper, Hezekiah. The first thing that God assures Hezekiah of is the power and the strength of his name, God's name. The reality of God's sovereignty and his control and his goodness over all of creation. See, a lot of times when we start with our prayers, they know I struggle with this sometimes. You know, I look at the, answer, the things that I pray for, and I want God to answer the things that I want. We see here that what we actually need as God's people is for his name to be glorified and his kingdom to come and his will to be done before we worry about what God is going to give us. It's only after addressing Sennacherib's boasts and claims to be greater than God that God turns to Hezekiah specifically and gives him a sign. That's kind of an interesting sign because it doesn't feel to us like much of a sign, does it? He says, well, the Assyrian army's conquest of the Jean countryside means that there will be no sowing or reaping for two more seasons. There will be enough to live on. A sign. Food's going to grow in the ground. The, the plants that you planted last year that the Assyrians have been trampling on and wiping out... They'll germinate seeds, and and they'll they'll grow again, and there will be enough, Hezekiah. And God goes on to say that the city will be saved. In fact, Jerusalem will not even come under attack in any meaningful way. There's no shields, no siege ramps against the city. Assyria is just going to vanish and go back to its own country. Now, at some level, this may not seem like these signs are very miraculous. I mean, we look at signs and we think about, you know, Gideon's fleece, right? We want to put something out and have it be, you know, have God, you know, make it wet or make it dry or have God, you know, write in the sky or something like that. And God says, no, your sign, Hezekiah, is that you just keep watching and see how I use the natural order of things to provide and protect and sustain you. I think like many of God's works, there are things that we're only able to see the hand of God in when we look back and we see what happened three months ago or six months ago or, or, or a year or 10 years or 25 years ago and we say, oh, that's what God was doing in my marriage, in my friendship. That's what God was doing in my career trajectory. That's what God was doing when he moved me from one place to another place, and he opened up that opportunity. I didn't really understand at that point how much God was in it. But I can see it now. It may not have seemed like that much of a sign at the time, but for Hezekiah, who currently isn't sure if his kingdom is going to make it for another month or two, The promise of a full recovery and the removal of the threat must have seemed an unimaginably good answer to prayer. And we hear again that God is not just in control of the world. God didn't just set it in motion and say, okay, here it goes. But God has a plan for good. As our contemporary testimony puts it, a place to work and play, worship and wonder, love and laugh. There's the assurance of God's provision that we may not be given success or prosperity as the world defines those things, but we will be given enough 
we will be given a space to see him at work, to laugh, and to wonder, and to worship, and to play. A space that God has given. This promise of God's gracious character and strength gives hopes in those moments when we can't see how things will turn out. And we see this all the more in God's promise of redemption, how God has entered into this world and he's used the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, this awful event that appeared like the world was ending and, and the reign of God was destroyed. And God uses this to create even more space to wonder and worship and adore and play. The world belongs to God, not to us or earthly powers. That's the message of Isaiah's prophecy for Hezekiah, and it's God's word for us today as well. We may feel like the forces of evil are too powerful for us, or alternatively, we may feel like the forces of good are so much within our grasp that it's only a matter of time before we're able to triumph. And I think if you look at the, the dialogue in a place like our country today, we see both of those things, right? We see this fear of an overwhelming evil sometimes, and, and other times we hear stories of a goodness that's so inevitable that it's going to triumph no matter what. And the Bible tells us that both of those narratives are false when they rest in our own strength. And so our task is to watch, not to watch for ways that we will succeed, but to watch for ways that we can rest in what God has done. To ask ourselves, how does God provide what is good in our own context? What are those things that we're seeing? What are those signs that we see along the way where God has done it again? And Hezekiah's experience that meant watching how over the months that followed, God orchestrated the Assyrian withdrawal from Judah. We don't know fully what happens in verse 35, what some kind of plague or pestilence or something like that that, that God uses to wipe out the Assyrian army. The interesting thing is that even historically, Greek historians tell of what they heard in, from the Egyptians that the Assyrian army just kind of disappeared and went back home. We don't know why. Maybe their, their, their supplies were ravaged is, is what the, the speculation is there. But, but something happened that God drove the Assyrians back home without a battle even needing to occur. And the fact that Sennacherib's retreat from, uh, in the pa his palace, when he's celebrating this, this conquest, supposedly, of, of, the, of Palestine, we talked about that last week, and I showed you the pictures of what's on Sennacherib's palace walls. Remember that? What's on there is pictures of the conquest of Lachish. Now, Sennacherib did defeat Lachish, but that wasn't the prize he was after. He didn't conquer Hezekiah. He didn't pull Hezekiah out of Jerusalem and, you know, and enslave him or, or torture him. Hezekiah is still on his throne. Jerusalem is still intact. It'd be a little like going for a foreign country and saying, hey, I'm going to see everything that there is to see in Massachusetts, and then the only pictures you send back are pictures of Worcester. Now, there's nothing wrong with Worcester, right? Like, I like Worcester. But the question that everyone would be asking is, well, where are your pictures of Boston? Where's your pictures of Boston Common? Where's your pictures of Faneuil Hall? Where's your pictures of the USS Constitution? And the answer that Sennacherib can give is, well, I never actually got there. Well, what happened, Sennacherib? Well, if we're going to be honest, God got in the way. It's through God's intervention that people could see his wonderful provision. The Bible wants to make clear that the end result of the king's, Assyrian king's way of life is judgment and death. And when Israel would look back on this history, on this period in its history, it could see God did it. There was no other way to explain it than God. And the same is true for us. The question is, where do we see God working? Where do we see him providing? And I challenge you this morning to look back on your life a year ago, five years ago, 25 years ago, and to ask yourself, where are those areas? Where are those places where I see that God opened up an avenue for me to serve him. He opened up space for me to see him. Maybe not because I, you know, I, I had a financial windfall or things went so well for my family or my friendships, but I can see that God was there. 
And it's this kind of an attitude that militates against any temptation to put our celebration all about us, whether it's our nation or our world or whether it's our own individual lives. There's always the temptation to celebrate in an idolater's fashion, our successes, the certainty that we have things right, maybe our open-mindedness, our flexibility, our compassion, our charm, our boldness, maybe even our victim status that gives us a unique ability to speak into the world's problems. This morning we remember that our world does not belong to God, or do not belong to us, but to God, who created it and continues to sustain all things in his fatherly care. We see that all the more this morning as we come around the communion table. When we gather here, we remember that God did something that we could never do for ourselves. That it's not our power or the forces of improvement in the world that can instill righteousness and eternal life in us. And so we need humility, that only divine authority can address the power of sin. Only a divine authority can, can grab it by the nose, so to speak and lead it away so it can no longer harm or destroy God's people. Here at the table, God shows us signs of his grace. He allows us to eat and drink what we did not produce ourselves, so that we as his church can take root and bear fruit, that we can be established in a community and place ourselves there so that we can sustain over a long time, ministry in one place. And we can be there long enough to see it begin to bear fruit. It's this table to which the remnant who are saved by grace are invited because the Son of God in his zeal for his people has gone to the cross as the penalty for sin and has been raised to life by the power of God. And here at the table, we see that God has indeed defended his people and he saved them. Not because we were so good or so worthy in ourselves, but for the sake of his name and for the sake of his son. And so this weekend we celebrate. We marvel at the gifts God has given us as part of a world that he created and sustains by grace. We commemorate the privileges we have as citizens of this country and heirs of the freedoms that were won for us by those who have gone before and served it well. But we delight this morning most of all that our salvation lies not in our independence or our ability to do things on our own, but in our dependence on the power and the grace and the mercy of God. For this world does not belong to us or earthly powers, but it belongs to God who gave us a place to work and play, worship and wonder, love and laugh through the saving work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.